Saudi is, of course, amongst the most uh, robustly growing markets in the region. We've seen about 9% growth in 2022, and we're expecting yet another quite sustainable 3.5% in 2023. Now, a combination of energy exports, large public investment projects, and that gradually improving consumption that we see in the kingdom will be driving set growth. And so as a result of all of that, we're seeing that actually multinationals around the world are reallocating quite a bit of resources towards the Saudi teams on the ground uh, in a bit to both capitalize on the growth that we're seeing right now, but also the much larger potential that is expected and anticipated through the long term as well. And perhaps we can actually maybe look at some of the um, demand dynamics. If we start with the public, we're seeing that public demand will be the main driver behind the strong economic growth. It will filter through both procurement and investment projects as well. And it's important for us to remember that public demand now comes from very uh, distinct channel. So we have two separate channels, the government treasury, which is the legacy spender, of course, but we also know, um, unsurprisingly, we, there's quite a lot of funding coming through um, the PIF. So the government wants to maintain stability and the immunity uh, to, to the main treasury. So we've seen that we usually countries do that so that they can uh, prevent any volatility with uh, large uh, investment projects affecting what some of the public finances look like. And so here in Saudi Arabia, we're seeing the exact same trend. So putting all of that together, we're seeing that businesses um, looking to tap into the uh, B2G uh, kind of opportunity. Uh, they're sourcing both and engaging with both stakeholders and the PIS uh, and other funds, as well as the legacy decision makers and the uh, government uh, authorities. Now, Saudi has come under, uh, or rather we've seen some quite ambitious uh, plans uh, that the government would like to realize in the long term, uh, particularly through 2030. But doing so does require quite careful financial management. So here at Front Review, we're actually expecting to see Saudi Arabia tracked very closely by its fiscal consolidation strategy, something that we've experienced over the last uh, two to three years or so. Uh, and now it's evolved to fiscal sustainability, but essentially it just means that there's going to be a lot more careful and calculated spending. That trend is expected to continue. And practically speaking, this means that some of the price reduction pressures will continue to linger. The negotiations are going to be quite comprehensive, thorough, to make sure that uh, at least the government on its, on its end is making sure that cost efficiency is as high as it can be. Um, we have to also remember that the country does aim to become a global investment hub, which means that surplus generation is being prioritized. It wants to cement itself as a very fiscal sustainable destination. And all of that filters through that uh, some of the fiscal consolidation and fiscal sustainability approaches. But more interestingly, we're starting to see the results of the government economic diversification efforts that, we, that have started over a few years ago. And particularly here, the non-oil activity is averaging a very healthy 5 to 6%. We expect this to continue well into the medium and the long term as well. Much of the reform policy we'll be focusing on in this webinar does fall within the objective of attracting firms from various industries to increase their footprint and the presence in the market, further growing the uh, portion of the non-oil economy and further cementing and, and kind of creating a more comprehensive uh, non-oil and diversified economy. And uh, as part of uh, Vision 2030, Saudi is building its economy to be sustainable and growing uh, essentially beyond the reliance uh, on oil. So there are many ongoing projects, many that you see on the slide in front of you. Um, it, it, that will essentially help the, the government um, match its, its ambition to uh, many, many projects. Uh, and of course, the size of some of these projects are undeniably attracting quite a lot of uh, interest from multinationals uh, and Saudi wants to build on that interest well into the to the long term. So one way to do that is the RHU program, which essentially facilitates uh, an increased footprint of multinationals on the ground, expanding their business activity, expanding the overall uh, non-oil uh, economic activity. And Valet, how about some of the more specific uh, healthcare uh, outlook as well? 
Of course. So Saudi Arabia is one of, if not the most important market for our healthcare clients, not just in the GCC, but in the wider MENA region as a whole. Uh, it's one of the highest spenders of healthcare uh, in the region, and its large and growing local population of around 22 million makes it unique in the GCC because it's much less vulnerable to expat inflows and outflows like we see in other markets such as the UAE or Qatar, for example. On top of this, the kingdom is embarking upon a very expansive healthcare reform agenda in the public sector. Basically, to put it simply, it is seeking to implement an accountable care organization model, and that model aims to increase uh, competition, attract investment, improve service delivery for patients, as those ACOs compete with one another uh, and with the private sector for patients. And a key aspect of that healthcare reform also in, uh, involves increasing private sector participation in healthcare and unlocking state owned assets for investment. The Ministry of Health aims to launch another 100 public private partnership opportunities worth around 12.7 billion US dollars over the next five years. And that seeks to not only increase procurement of healthcare solutions, but also more actively involve global healthcare companies in healthcare provision in the kingdom. So for those reasons, Saudi Arabia is a very exciting opportunity for our healthcare clients. Definitely across the spectrum, there's a lot of uh, positive momentum for growth and opportunities that we're seeing. But of course, the country still has some uh, operational challenges, numerous operational challenges that uh, we know our clients face from enhancing IP protection to creating more predictability in regulations. I think one of which um, we're talking about today to easing trading processes, costs to many other challenges. And of course, one of the latest addition to this challenging environment has been high inflation in the last few years. So generally speaking, um, we've seen higher inflation in the last two uh, to three years the headline inflation should moderate in 2023, uh, but of course, still um, prices are going to be up 30% compared to what we had in March 2020. So all of this uh, really uh, just means some ongoing elevated um, kind of operating cost environment with us to continue. Um, and of course, cost predictability is a bit of a, a challenge in the market. Um, but uh, of course, um, what basically, uh, I actually, before we move on to even more details on, on the regulation, what we wanted to share um, was some more insights on the regional headquarters program. I know we've gotten some questions. First of all, for those of you uh, who have joined us now, we will be sharing with you the recording of this webinar uh, and the slides. So don't uh, rush to take a lot of notes. And then we have received some questions on the regional headquarters uh, program. So let's share with you, Monster, I'll turn it over to you to give us an introduction to the uh, broad framework, and then we'll uh, dig into the details. Perfect, thank you, Zainab. So yeah, maybe starting right at the top in 2019, Saudi Arabia issued a notice requiring uh, multinational companies to have their regional headquarters based in the kingdom in order to be able to sell to the public sector. Now, the legal and practical details of this regulation, uh, which will be effective uh, first day of 2024, uh, recently became a lot more clear. Now, we need not only understand the specification, but also internally in the line on the best way that we can comply with it, uh, serving both the compliance requirements, but also the wider region uh, investment and the operational plans that we have for ourselves. And very briefly put, uh, multinationals looking to sell their goods or services to government authorities in Saudi Arabia will require a new business license, which in itself requires setting up a legal entity known as the regional headquarters, which has to be based within the country and it allows you essentially access to these tenders. Uh, importantly here, this is irrespective of whether you are uh, dealing directly or indirectly with the market. Even if you have an indirect presence, you would be uh, likely uh, come under the same regulations. Hi, my name is Krista Regani and I'm marketing director here at Frontierview. I'd like to thank you for watching a segment of this webinar. If you'd like access to the full video and our latest insights, data, and research, sign up for a free trial with us today. Simply scan the QR code on the screen.